My name is Pastor D.A., one of the pastors here at the bridge. It's a delight that God has brought you. We're excited about his word. Man, this morning, I'm just sharing this because it's cool. This morning, I was downtown Kernersville before the sun came up. I got this weird inkling to go down to the center of the city and uh, the intersection um, on Mountain and Main Street and uh, to pray. So, so it's dark and um, I'm trying to... Um, be incognito as much as possible. People are going to be like, what's this drunk guy doing wandering around downtown? Drunk in the spirit, right? But anyway, so I had my phone and when a car would pull up, you know, I was acting like I was looking at my phone. <laughs> when, they, uh, when the cars drove up, I got in the middle of the intersection of our city at the crossroads. I'm like twirling around, praying for revival in the city, right? And then I come in here and she's like, bring revival, Lord. And I'm like, yes, God, I'm so excited. So I hope you are too, because it's coming. I heard another pastor say one time that uh, I was listening to a teaching and he said, you know, what's interesting about praying for revival is praying for revival is wanting God to work. And often when you pray for revival, God will choose to work through somebody else so you don't get the credit for it. And I'm like, okay, God. I'm going to keep praying for revival anyways, right? However it comes, it's not about us. It's about him being glorified. If this is your first time here, I hope you got a bulletin on the way in. There's lots of information on there. Also, don't forget First Friday prayer on the 6th, I believe, February 6th, but the first Friday of the month at 6 p.m. It's moved up an hour, I believe. But if you stop by the um, bulletin boards in the hallways, um, there's lots of other information about what's going on, some of the highlighted events. So they often tie in with the announcement uh, video that you just saw a couple minutes ago. Uh, the year-end letters, just a minute of house business here, the year-end letters for your generosity will be being mailed out tomorrow. So thank you all for your faithfulness and giving to the Lord. Uh, as I just mentioned, the bulletin and the, the, there's a lot of materials that it takes on a week-to-week basis, and those materials are provided uh, from the Lord and through your partnership and what He's doing in this ministry. So thank you for your faithfulness, and you know, let's keep, uh, let's start the year strong, right, with our first fruits and what He wants to do uh, as He lays it on your heart. All right, so we're going to be in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 14, where Pastor Kevin left off. Him and I are in Luke, Pastor David is in Colossians, I'm excited about that what the Lord has for us, as I mentioned 15 times already. If you don't have a Bible, if you want to raise your hand, one of the ushers would love to get you a Bible so you can follow along with us. We're going to be going verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Expositionally, we're going to explain and expound on the verses that we read so we can have a takeaway when we go home and live this thing out, this faith. It's a living, real faith. Before we do that, let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for seasons. Lord, your word said after the flood that seasons were a part of your blessing. And so you've given us seasons. So thank you for the seasons, Lord. And uh, thank you for this time that you've allowed where we can come together and read your word and encourage one another and be encouraged by you. And it's also an opportunity to use the gifts that are yours in us. Father, to be a blessing to other people. So we pray that uh, even right now, God, that uh, we each would be encouraged and blessed in your word. Lord, that we would grow in our knowledge of you and be even more equipped to reach others for your glory. And Lord, if someone, if maybe they haven't met you yet or they're getting to know you, Jesus, I pray that uh, today that the, your word would speak to them and encourage them in taking that next step in their relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Cool, so we're gonna be in Luke chapter 11, like I mentioned, starting in verse 14, not far after uh, the Lord's prayer in scripture. It's interesting, the, um, the Lord's Prayer in there in the beginning of Luke is different than the one in Matthew. It's actually uh, not, not as much as recorded um, there. It's a little bit shorter. I heard someone say, um, you know, as we follow Jesus, it doesn't get more complex. It gets simpler. You know, just love Jesus and love other people. It's good. All right, so here we go. Verse 14. Interesting text we're in. Uh, And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes 
marveled. It's an interesting text here. So the demon apparently was mute. The demon was living in a human being. That's a real thing. This Bible is supernatural. You know, sometimes we watch the Marvel movies or these uh, interesting supernatural sci-fi movies. And a lot of times those things are closer to reality in some ways than, you know, we might initially imagine or think about. Well, we see that here when this guy, uh, he's possessed. Demons living in him. I think it's interesting that, uh, that he's mute. I think it's important for us to realize that that's exactly what the devil wants to do in everybody's life in this room. The devil wants to mute you from talking about what God has done in your life. What God wants to do in your life. If the, if the devil can even mute you before you even get to know Jesus, the original text here may, uses the word, you know, dumb, unable to speak, um, That's a, that's, a, that's a simple strategy. It makes us think of John chapter 10 where uh, Jesus says, uh, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, right? But Jesus said that he came to give us life and life abundantly. You know, I think that the, the devil can use many methods to make us mute, to, to make us not talk about what God is doing in our life, right? He can use fear. So maybe you're not possessed, maybe, and we'll talk a little bit about possession here in just a moment, but maybe there's not a demonic spirit living in you, you've professed Jesus as Lord, Jesus is living in you, but the enemy can oppress. He can convince you that there's gonna be a bad end if you talk about Jesus, he can convince you you're going to get fired if you're in the workplace. And I'm not talking about, we've mentioned before, not disrespecting uh, your organization. We're not talking about disrespecting or, or not walking in integrity where God has placed you uh, to earn an, earn an income. Uh, but there can be some added fear that's not from the Lord. I think another way he can... Um, clearly get us to not talk is doubt like God if I talk about you that person might say that I'm silly God if I talk about you um, maybe you're not really speaking to me in the first place I don't have anything to say to them like you know sometimes when you're like okay I don't know if this happens to you but your heart your insides are like burning to tell someone maybe invite them to church or maybe pray for them, or maybe tell them, hey, that this week they were on your heart and you prayed for them in your private time, and you know that they were going through something in that moment and you wanted to encourage them in it, and before you speak to them, the enemy creates a doubt in your heart that that happened at all. Or he can create fear saying that that person is gonna respond in a way that's uh, adverse to the moment. So you don't, you don't do it. I think it's important for us to realize that that's a strategic plan of the enemy to prevent us from being used by God. Here's a, think about this. If there was a, a, a big pot of money up here, okay, it's just a practical, relatable thing to talk about. Um, if there was a big pot of money up here um, for you, Okay, it's for y'all. Uh, and there was an enemy, okay? Would the enemy want you to have that? No. If, if your adversary uh, was able to prevent you from receiving that gift of financial gain, would your adversary want you to have that? If that gift was, had the ability where you could give that gift to others as well, would your adversary want you to be able to tell other people that they can be a part of receiving that blessing? No, the, the adversary will want to shut you up from telling people about this treasure. He would want to even, you know, 
not allow you to receive the treasure. Are we talking about Jesus? Are we inviting consistently? Is that the thing that's on the forefront of our mind? How do we respond when there is, do we, do we recognize this is a spiritual attack against me to not talk about Jesus? I think often that we, we mix up a spiritual attack with um, saying something is an inopportune time. Or we allow peer pressure uh, to get, here, let me read this verse. Genesis 46, 31 through 34. This is Joseph in Egypt, okay? And Joseph has reunited with his brothers, okay? His, he has sent his brothers back to Canaan to get their dad, Jacob, whose name is now Israel. So Israel's going to come back, Jacob, and the rest of his family and their stuff, their belongings, are going to come to Egypt and live in the land of Goshen for 400 years. And look what's said here in chapter 46. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for their occupation has been to feed livestock. And they have brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what's your occupation? So when they get to the land, when Joseph's family gets to the land, Pharaoh's going to want to talk to them. When he talks to you, verse 33 So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what's your occupation? Verse 34, that you shall say, your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. Here it comes. Here's the reason why we're reading this. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Think about what we're reading right here. They are moving to a land to find food and provision through God's grace, right? A land that is against their occupation. How similar, Bible illustrations, you know, you can find loopholes in anything. But this has encouraged me, so I want to encourage you with it, okay? We're in the world. And the world is being governed by the devil. Point blank blank and period. The world right now, principality over the earth is the devil okay in a lot of ways we face that on a daily basis what does a shepherd do a shepherd in the scriptures it's about being in a pasture and eating God's word delighting in Jesus right Jesus says I am the true shepherd right if you want to find green pasture he is the only way right and so when you give your life to Jesus then what you start to share the word with other people you, you start to find delight in God's word. And God calls you kings, priests, and prophets. That means you, you definitely share the word with other people. You are a divine ambassador on the earth for his glory. You are a shepherd in the land of Egypt. Because realistically, this isn't our home. This isn't our home. It's not my home. I'm here temporarily. You can call me an alien if you like. People are like, do you believe in aliens? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't always say that, but uh, it's true. So I think that it, 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 there's, we're already set up to be in an, um, an unsettled situation. Like it's going to be hostile to follow Jesus. And if you're trying to share the green pasture that Christ is and wants to feed us his word with other people, it's going to be, there's going to be friction. We know that. So, here's in in lieu of exorcism for just a moment. Um, If someone has not professed Jesus as Lord, okay, They are an empty vessel. In other words, there's God's not living in them. And a demon can take up residence in their in their heart. I know this sounds crazy, and if this isn't your cup of tea, 
uh, let's just, you know, just hang on a second, I guess. But it's the Word, okay? It's, it's the Bible. And, uh, you know, maybe we're all in different places growing in our maturity. But I say this. Um, what's interesting about exorcism is I, I've been, I have personally been a part of some uh, or someone being delivered where a demon has left them. Um, I, I heard someone say this week, and I had never put two and two together, that it's important that you remember when someone is possessed that they, that they want to be healed and they want Jesus. The man on the, at the, in the gatherings, when Jesus uh, sailed over the Lake of Galilee and the man from the tombs came running out, to, he, he came running out to Jesus' feet. Even though he was possessed, he, the man wanted healing. So uh, it's much like when we share the gospel. You know, sometimes we, we want someone to give their life to Jesus because we know the blessing that it is, but if that person doesn't want it, that timing is up to the Lord, right? So in the same way with some of this, this more... Uh, someone more, even more yielded to Satan, we might say, you know, I'm about to deal with this right now. And God has given us authority to, to bind up, right? Okay, there is some, we have been given some authority there. Uh, but ultimately, realistically, Jesus is the only one who can deliver, okay? And it's important that that person wants that healing, wants that healing. All right, so... It's actually a verse there, Mark 5, 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. So what, the, what Jesus wants for you and what the devil wants for you are what? Are they the same? Yeah, they're completely different. They're opposite, right? The devil wants you to be completely isolated from God for all of eternity, devil does not want you to have a relationship with God. He doesn't want you to go to heaven. Jesus wants what? He wants the relationship between you and him restored. Jesus wants you to be with him for all of eternity. What they want is opposite. I think that it's important for us to remember if, if, if you haven't made a decision for Jesus yet, just that in, in and of itself is a, an expression of God's love for you. If you're like, okay, maybe I do believe in God. Maybe I do believe that Jesus lived, but why should I surrender my life to Jesus? Okay, well, look at the opposite of surrendering your life to Jesus. Okay, it's, it's to live for darkness right and that principality whether knowingly or unknowingly that's what happens okay so that Jesus would die like Satan didn't die for you that Jesus would provide a way for you to live forever like like that graciousness that that um expression of concern for you should be clear you know, I buy my wife a flower and a card, and I continue to express my love for her. Or if, if there's someone else or some, somebody who, who, you know, mistreats or doesn't do kind gestures, it's clear which way we should go. So if you haven't made a decision for Jesus, just stop for a minute and just think about, like make a list of what God has done so you can have a relationship with him forever and what that relationship entails. And then look, make a list of what the world has to offer you and and how the world is wooing you into that relationship. It's it's not unreasonable. People, People say, well, we have to lose your mind at the door to make a decision for Jesus. I don't see that. You know, it's, it's clear. Yes, you're going to come up to a point where it does take a step of faith. It does, 10 times out of 10. I think that it's interesting how the devil will try and distract us toward causes that we think are positive to mute us. 
If the devil can get, uh, we've mentioned this book several times here. And uh, actually, the Screw Tape Letters, C.S. Lewis. I hadn't read it. I just started reading it um, recently. And there's something in here that I think applies to uh, world events, specifically America right now. And throwing this out, I do not think the prophetic time clock is based on America, okay? I don't, we don't see that in Scripture. It's based on Israel, right? We don't believe in replacement theology. But I want to read you something really brief as far as it relates to the devil wanting to mute you. The, the, the devil having a specific attack to get you to not to talk. The premise of the book, the Screw Tape Letters, is a demon and another demon. And one demon is the uncle. And the uncle is writing to the demon nephew strategy on how to prevent a Christian from being a Christian and or following Jesus and or being effective in that. Okay, so we're getting the, the behind the scenes. It's um, not all biblical. It's a, a lot of conjecture, but it does contemplate. Uh, remember, all illustrations should point us back to the main thing, which is Jesus, right? We want to keep that in check. We don't want to do this and start chasing this idea. We want to let that idea bring us to the word of God. And then this is what we find our ultimate delight and instruction in. But can I read this paragraph real quick? I think you'll enjoy it. Hopefully it'll help you. It says, uh, this is the, the uncle demon writing to the nephew demon. He says, whichever he adopts, your main task will be the same. Let him begin by treating the patriotism or the pacifism as a part of his religion. Then let him, under the influence of a partisan spirit, come to regard it as the most important part. Then quietly and gradually nurse him on the stage at which the religion becomes merely a part of the cause, in which Christianity is valued chiefly because of the excellent arguments it can produce in favor of the British war effort or of pacifism. The attitude which you want to guard against is that in which the temporal affairs are treated primarily as material for obedience. Once you have made the world an end and faith a means, listen to that, once you have made the world an end and faith a means, you have almost won your man and it makes very little difference what kind of worldly end he is pursuing. So he's talking about if you can get someone so zealously patriotic that that becomes their focus in everything you do, you've also then muted them from talking about Jesus. And or opposite of extreme patriotism, which, listen, my dad served. He I loved the military. Okay, so we're not, I'm not speaking dishonoring or disrespecting men who have been called, and women who have been called to serve our country. Okay, I, I I have great admiration for that. I do believe it's a calling on someone's life. Okay, so we're not, we're, I'm not arguing or talking about that specifically. But the opposite of an overzealousness for patriotism is an overzealousness for passiv passivism. Okay, Ex overexpression about one cause or over, um, you know, being mute toward the other way. So I'm just not going to say something about stuff that's going on or I'm going to say too much about this one thing that's going on. And what happens, both isolate us on spectrums we're not supposed to be when we're supposed to be here talking about Jesus. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Because then what happens is, as, as mentioned immediately, we begin to talk about this cause or we begin to not talk at all for fear of disruption and we don't talk about Jesus as our number one priority. He says clearly, our relationship with Jesus is not a means to explain something that we, should, we think should be important or reality. It's the other way around. These things create opportunities for us to talk about Jesus. So it wouldn't be, I'm a believer, so I stand up for this right. This right is, no, it's, um, 
I think this right is something that we could discuss because here's what the Bible says about it. Let's see how this relates to us following Jesus Christ. So in a, in a politically tumultuous climate that we live in currently in our society, you know, when people start to overemphasize this or overemphasize that, or they don't want to do anything about any of it, it's great to bring up Jesus. Bring the conversations consistently and continually back to Jesus. And things will go well for you and it'll go well for them. I like this book. It's pretty cool. I encourage you to maybe check it out. All right. So, life lesson. The devil wants to mute you, your relationship with Jesus, and others who share about him with you. So he, he wants to mute anybody talking about God. He wants to mute you, uh, hearing from God, talking about God. He wants to mute your relationship with God, and does it reduce your proactivity. And then he also wants to prevent other people from fanning that flame in you. He doesn't want them talking about Jesus with you either. It's really good. All right, so let's keep going. Verse 15. But some of them said, so after this moment where someone was cast out, a demon was cast out of a person, excuse me, but some of them said in verse 15, he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, remember Jesus knows our thoughts, another example of his deity. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Verse 21, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. Let's talk about this for a few minutes. So the first thing we mention is what? Jesus did something awesome. Uh, and the devil was trying to mute that person so they couldn't previously, they, you know, Jesus doesn't want someone talking about Jesus, doesn't want someone knowing Jesus, okay? There's just a com complete attack for isolation on that person to be entrapped in darkness. Jesus does something awesome. When Jesus does something awesome, who do they want to give the glory to? Satan. They said, oh, you did that by the devil's power. It's consistent that when God moves, the devil will then try another curveball because the first one didn't work, and he's going to say, well, that's of the devil. Well, that's just kooky and crazy and not right. The devil always, he always wants to cloud, distort, and divide the work of Jesus. The devil always wants to, he wants to cloud, he wants to distort, where you can't really focus, what is that? He wants to just make it uh, where you can't really nail down, is that Jesus moving or not? And he wants to divide what God has done. Jesus has just delivered someone from the power of Satan, and someone immediately says it's the devil. Side note, Beelzebub, actually in the original language, nomadic language, uh, Bel, B-E-E-L right there is actually a form of Baal, which means God, you know, B-A-A-L. And then there's some controversy on what the Zabub means. Some say it means um, flies. Uh, others say it means dung. So Lord of dung or Lord of the flies, you know. And 
There's some other parts in uh, Kings where uh, the, the, a people group called the Ekronites um, uh, worshipped uh, Beelzebub specifically. You can dig into that on your own time. But whether it was a name for a false idol or it was a name that was placed on the devil himself, it's not good, all right? It's not good. So that was a little side note. Listen, when you share your faith here on earth, we talked about shepherds in Egypt. When you share your faith here on earth in a uh, and it's fictitious, it's going to go against culture and someone's going to want to come up with a reason of why it's bad that you did that. It goes against what's good. Think about this. Think about, uh, think about a dark room. We've talked about this, a dark room, right? And there's, it's dark, okay? And you pull the chain on the lamp, it then lights the room. Well, that is going to cause di- disruption to everyone else in the room has, who has become acclimated to the darkness. And they're not going to be uh, overexcited or full of encouragement that... I keep thinking of this horrible example, and so it's just, uh, you know, sends the cockroaches running. You know, I don't know why... You know, and they're like, ah, ah, right? You know, it's just weird. It's not a great example at all, please. Uh, because we love, we, love, we love people. We don't love all cockroaches, but we do love, we love people. When you stand up for Jesus, it's going to be countercultural. Don't be afraid of being countercultural. My son was telling me about a hashtag called for the culture right now. And he was like, you know, it should be for Jesus or for him or for his culture, you know? Okay, I'm, listen to this. Is there in any situation, you ready? Watch this. This is a great indicator to discern if God's at work or the devil's at work. Because they're like, the devil's at work. You, you're doing that by the devil, right? Here, here's a great simple indicator. Is there sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties? In a situation, is there that? Or is there love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? In any climatic or anti-cultural situation, which one do you see? And if you clearly see fruit of God's kingdom, the Holy Spirit, be at rest. But it's also a great witnessing tool. Because when someone tries to make an accusation against you, right, you can bring this, like, you don't have to pull out your verse out of your pocket and show them, you can if they're there, but you can help them reason, right? You can help them, you can love them by saying, hey, well, let's think about this situation. I just shared my faith with someone at work or I just prayed with someone at work. That person just had a loss in their family. They were crying and they were looking for help. And I just stopped on our break time in an appropriate place within our workplace and prayed with that person. At their request, they respectfully agreed that I would pray with them. And they walked away encouraged, more focused on their tasks today at work, and have hope for the future. How is that not a good thing? Now, of course, it's all done in the name of Jesus. Uh, You're like, dude, this is like 101. Yeah, I know it's 101, but here's what I think that's important to realize you know, we need to get a, our head out of the clouds a lot of time and let the rubber hit the road and share our faith right now. Because doctrine and theology is fun, but those are just a means to win people to Jesus and be a disciple myself, right? And that, this isn't, this isn't a, a shot. This is how, how I'm uh, meditating on and thinking about what the Lord is doing in my life. Like, 
yeah, man, I like getting on my knees and spending time with the Lord and him revealing some neat stuff to me. And those things that he reveals often are um, neat ways to share my faith with others, right? But practically and consistently, um, when I share my faith, the world tries to throw at me a curveball to prevent me from doing it. And we need to be ready for that smash in the face from the enemy. He's going to punch you in the face probably. Somehow, some way, for taking a stand for Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? And I think a lot of times maybe we don't share our faith about Jesus because we're scared of the punch of them faith. That's crazy, I know. But spiritually, that's what happens. And we as a body of strong believers here at the bridge who are well-fed and, 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 and ready for what God wants to do in their life, just we have to recognize that that's the current attack that's coming. Is someone saying, well, you're full of hatred for sharing your faith and condemning that person. I was like, I didn't say anything about what they may have been entangled with. I was just trying to bring the blessing of Jesus Christ on their life. I work with people currently of all different denominational backgrounds and de denominational resentments and current lifestyle decisions that in some ways is contrary to the word of God. And I have for years in my Christian faith overemphasized that uh, break in the relationship with him or what they're specifically doing against God instead of specifically coming to love them, get on my feet and uh, knees and wash their feet for Jesus. You know, I, I don't even do that in my own household all the time. You know, I'll say, uh, you know, instead of helping with the problem, I'll point out the problem. Okay, that was for me, I guess. <laughs> my wife's like, <laughs> sorry. I think she's serving today, so she didn't hear it unless you tell her. Right? Um, I, I know this is, it is what it is. I trust the Lord. Here's a great example, I think. Lettuce on your teeth. Right? You get some lettuce on your teeth, right? You have no clue. Right? The, you're, you're walking around cheesing at everybody at work. Looks like you're missing a tooth right there, okay? And uh, people are just, you know, awkwardly just turning their head and not saying anything to you about it, right? And then someone tells you, you got lettuce on your teeth, bro, and it's an embarrassing moment, right? You're like, oh, snap. Let me go to the bathroom. Let me pull out my phone and do a selfie and get that thing off. However, okay? It's also equally important that if we see lettuce in somebody else's teeth, that we share it with them. You know, this week I had a great conversation with someone and they challenged me in some ways. And, uh, you know, they said, hey, man, you might have some lettuce on your teeth right here, right? And so what did I do? I told them they were a horrible person for telling me that I had lettuce on my teeth and don't talk to me like that ever again. I've done that. When someone tries to point out something in my life that uh, God might want to be working on, and it, it, it's kind of like, oh man, that hurt. I thought I was good in that area. And they're just, they're being a servant of the Lord coming to share this truth with me. So in that moment, I have, and I know we all, and you probably are learning this too, that it's best in that moment. Yeah, you're, you're staggering for a second. You know, but just go, go get on your knees and talk to Jesus about it with his word. That's a great solution because he will illuminate to you what's what. Well, however, he will minister to you. He's perfect. Like he's the best, uh, you know, he's God. Like there's no imperfection in his ministry to you. That's a good word, isn't it? There is no imperfection in Jesus' ministry to you. It's perfect. So when he ministers to you, you can fully trust, you can fully relax, you can fully receive. Wow. So get on your knees with Jesus when someone speaks a word into your life and say, God, let me contemplate, let me consider. What are you saying? Show me in your word. Speak to me through the power of your Holy Spirit. 
And if there's lettuce in your teeth, just get the lettuce out, bro. Sis, friend, family, you know? It's nothing weird. We just watched a video, Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. You know, I've, I've been following Jesus for a, a little while now, and it's still, it's not like, yay, that person just spoke that challenging word in my life. You know, it's like, oh, hold on a minute, God. And I had, I'm specifically being... Um, yeah, I had that this week. Someone shared something in my life and it, I, you know, I, I had the opportunity to, uh, to, to miss the blessing. To, you hear what I'm saying? But instead I went and spent time with Jesus and I received a blessing from that word that that brother shared with me this week. Life lesson. The devil wants to distort, cloud, divide, and cast doubt on the work of God. Are you connecting that? God's trying to do something, and the devil wants to say, no, 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 that's not the Lord. And I'm, just, just pray about it. and just let's. This happens to be where we are in Scripture. It's cool. Verse 23. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Do you realize that everything we do is sowing seed? I mean, it's, it's even the mundane things that we do that we consider empty and void are keeping us from being proactive in our faith. Listen, I'm not trying to be hyper spiritual like, or like over dramatic. You know, I, I understand that we're all being transformed, right? If you've made a decision for Jesus Christ, we're being renewed and hopefully on a day-to-day basis, we are more proactive in the things of God than what we were initially six months ago, a year ago, 10 years ago. Like hopefully, if you did a time study, someone mentioned that recently, a time study, maybe Neil, Pastor Neil, appreciate that, bro. So maybe if you do a time study on your day, you know, is it, are you spending some time with Jesus? Are you about his business? Are you gathering or are you scattering? Um, I have a question. Think about this. I was sitting underneath an excavator recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, was, I had the responsibility to crawl under this excavator and look at underneath the excavator to make sure that everything was top notch. Okay, So I'm underneath this excavator and there's people around me working and there's just life. Just life is happening. So I just stop for a minute and I just listen. You, we can call it eavesdropping if you want. <laughs> I wasn't, I, that wasn't the intent. I was just working. And I was in a quiet environment where there was noise around me. And I was listening to the noise that was around me. And I heard the noise clearly. And it was so plain that the noise was either gathering or scattering for Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, maybe sometimes I, we have, you have, we've heard a lot of scattering through coarse jesting through work talk, right? Through, hey, teenagers, through being at the skate park, through being on the basketball, by being at church in the hallway, what is the conversation? Is it edifying, glorifying? Is it encouraging? Is it making disciples? Brother Mike says. You know, what, 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 are you consistently gathering for Jesus Christ? We're, one, we're doing that one or the other. Now, if, you, if, Jesus, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you're a gatherer, right? You're looking for opportunities to love other people on his behalf and share his goodness with them, right? Art, hopefully. Man, I wish you could see your faces right now. I, I don't... I'm, I feel like I'm on an island for just that moment right there. Like, uh, I, I, no, it's an intense thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for this discussion, right? From God's word, discussing God's word. It's a great thing to be discussing. And are we discussing God's word consistently outside of here? You know, it's something I'm asking myself. God, what am I saying to people around me? What if, what's my primary thought? I got the biggest compliment recently and it, 
I hope I don't embarrass the person. No, I'm not going to say a name. But someone says, really, can you just take a break? Do you always have to be talking about and thinking about Jesus? I wanted to wave my shirt around like a helicopter. You know, I was like, heck yeah. Sorry. If you like hip-hop music from back in the day. Um, <laughs> North Carolina. Um, What was I saying? You know, I do think that, uh, we know that, guys. What is a perfect day at work look like for you? Or, you know, maybe you're a a homemaker, maybe um, you're retired. You know, whatever God currently has as your occupation, be it, you know, you've already retired and you're doing stuff for yourself, maintaining, you know, the good things that God has given you, whatever that, what is that, when you set your mind, when you're working on something on a consistent day, what does that perfect day look like for you? Think about this. Like, okay, for me, mine is, you know, I get there on time. That's a great start, right? Um, I make roll call. Um, It's uh, being ready when I get there, not in a frazzle. To me, that's important, okay? Just I mean, it's just my, we all have different personalities and different traits, but this is important. Um, So a perfect day at work for me means I'm like, I'm, I've already, I'm thinking ahead so that after that roll call and I go to my position in the workplace, I've already, uh, I'm not behind trying to figure out what to do. I'm ahead and I'm able to create momentum because I know what I'm going to do that day, which therefore then allows me to be more productive for the company so that the company's blessed. And if the company's blessed, God is glorified and I get blessed too. But uh, specifically as it relates to my occupation, I want, to, I want to be present when I need to be present. I want to be prepared when I need to be prepared. I want to be, ha- have already planned. And so that when I start my work, I already have a strategy and I can create momentum and be even more productive, right? What does a great day following Jesus look like for you? Do you mope into your workplace? Do you mope into your Christianity? Right? How is that a testimony for his goodness in our life? I'm not saying we don't have bad days, horrible days, maybe a stretch of bad days, right? And I'm not saying we're that, that person, that type A personality, everybody in this room who's like, well, dude, you need to calm down, okay? You know, I get you. I hear you. I know what you're saying. Okay, I'm calming down. But whatever Christ has made you to be, do you mope into that? Are you full of thankfulness and, and gratefulness and consider, considering it an opportunity? for him to be glorified on the earth through you. Wow. There's nothing better. That's life. To me, that's life. Yeah, that's life, bro. Life is, um, life is Jesus. Whether I'm building excavators, delivering pizza, or sharing his word, it's all for his glory, hopefully. And when I mess up, say something ridiculous, do something that's against his character. I pray that as a body of believers here that we would recognize it, ask his forgiveness, receive his forgiveness that he's already paid for for us and get back up and follow Jesus, right? Right? Praise the Lord, man. Let's do this. There's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than that. Our life, each and every moment matters. Are you helping to achieve making disciples or are you hurting it? I have a question. And we've said this before. Are we in a Jesus jersey playing for the other team? You know, I've seen, I've seen that. I've seen someone wear, like, it actually say Jesus on their shirt. And I'm like, I, I, wouldn't, know that you, I wouldn't know that you know him. You know, I wouldn't know. I, that's not a shot, okay? That's not a shot. This is, 
Iron sharpening iron, right? You, okay, I want to mention this. This has uh, been a meditating, thinking about Pastor Kevin's teaching, uh, you know, just because that's where I'm at, I'm studying at uh, for uh, this purpose, the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of Luke, you know, our Father who art in heaven, holy be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and give us this day, this day, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from evil, for thine is the kingdom. For, for it's your glory and it's your power. In Jesus' name, amen. I would encourage you to think about, consider praying that. When Jesus says, you know, when, when there's a, a rift about um, in the scriptures, when there's a rift about, you know, vain repetition, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't repeat a prayer that Jesus has outlined. It means just to not just be blabbing and just running your mouth and just going through it and not having it. It's kind of like taking communion without remembering Jesus. It's not a good place to be in, right? He says to, you know, Paul says clearly to uh, do it in a worthy manner. Well, in the same way, when we're repeating something that Jesus has shared with us, a treasure, it's important to be thoughtful and considerate and recognize the moment. But I say all that to say this, man, it's just been powerful in my life praying that every single day, along with the other things that I petition and talk to Jesus about, intercede over. Do you hear what I'm saying? Ask God's will be done in your life this day. And then what happens is it creates a rest. I'm not going to go back and teach that. Pastor Kevin is, high five, Pastor Kevin. All right. Another thing. Praying in tongues. Praying in an unknown language to you. I don't know where you're at on that, man. It's, you know, if you're still, uh, if you've already formed an opinion about praying in tongues, it's, you know, hopefully it's a favorable one. Because I've been, I, I would be, I would be unwise to not find a treasure or re-find a treasure, right, that God has given us. I would be unwise to not tell you about it when we're all on the same team, right? Like, I want you to be blessed, right? Family, I would encourage you, if you pray in tongues privately, personally, I do not expect anybody to stand up and start speaking in tongues. I'm not expecting that, please. Um, but privately, that personal prayer language I would encourage you to be praying in tongues, like often, like a lot. Paul said, I wish you prayed as much as I did in tongues. I pray more than you all. That's what he says. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is on love, 14 back onto the gifts. Not trying to be weird about this moment, but God knows best, right? And sometimes I come to him with my assumptions and presumptions when I pray, Or I can pray according to his intercession with his Holy Spirit, knowing what to pray, and I fall in line with that. And so I encourage, you know, often I don't know what I'm saying. Sometimes, honestly, I think I get a little glimpse of what's, I'm learning. But sometimes I think I get a little glimpse of what we're praying about, what Jesus is doing. You know, that's, that's a, Side note for another day, another discussion. But what I am seeing, family, and this is important for you to know, and maybe you just, you, you have prayed in tongues in the past. Maybe it's just something that you, it's dormant right now. You just haven't been doing it. Man, I'm seeing dunamis power at life in my work after that moment. And you know, I'm not sure about your opinion about praying on tongues, but here's the thing. You know, I, I'm trusting God's word. I'm, I'm presenting myself to him, a living sacrifice. I'm allowing him to work through me in a biblical way. And after that moment, if I see godly fruit for his glory, I'm going to continue that with him. I mean, why not? Right? And if I get up there and he was like, man, what? what? Like, well, thanks for saving all those people, even though. So here's one. I just, I'm going to tell you about. So, um, 
So this is all, this is all has, has been renewed recently, okay? Just being personal, just being transparent is what it is. Uh, this has been renewed in the last, I don't know, month or so, okay? This prayer, prayer language, okay? I don't know why. The Lord just brought it up, and so I have been. And uh, a couple weeks ago, someone here in the fellowship, um, their family member uh, fell, uh, you know, went to the hospital, was going to have surgery. And so when I got that information, I was in a place where I couldn't go visit. I was at work, and uh, it is what it is. I was delivering pizza, okay? It was cool. So... Um, which is a totally spiritual task, believe it or not. I email leaders here at the bridge to let them know that there's a need in our fellowship and we, if it'd be good if someone can go pray over this family member, okay? And I'm praying while I send the email at appropriate time, I stop and wait, and then I'm up to go deliver next and I am supposed to go deliver at the place the family member is at in the hospital, okay? Oh, Okay, so, oh, just, just hang on one more. Praise the Lord, right? That's so cool, man. It's the best. Ah, Jesus. Uh, there's warfare too, right? But, okay, so I go to the hospital, pizza and ham, looking forward to just stopping by and praying really quickly over the family member who's a part of this fellowship whom we love. And I go to this, uh, I'm in a waiting room and there's a family there and distraught. And I said, hey, I may be a pizza man, but I'm a pastor too. And something is obviously wrong. How can I pray? And uh, that's not a normal thing for someone to say, right? So there was the dividing line between um, receptivity and rebuke right there. And so I aimed myself toward the receptivity to see what God wanted to do. And the next thing you know, I'm standing in someone's hospital room whom I have no idea who they are, who they said was on life support and that they weren't able to transport them because their health condition was so bad, but they needed to get to another hospital. They needed health to improve. And so I just pray politely, respectfully, cordially, and the person opens her eyes, sits up and looks at me. I'm like, I, I look into family, I'm like, is this, have they been doing this the whole time? I mean, I haven't seen a lot of people do that before, you know? So I kept thoughts contained, still want to be respectful and professional and say, thank you. As the family was in tears, I left. And I went and go, to go pray for our other friend. Are you kidding me right now? Like, that's not, right? That's the Lord doing something in our city for his glory. And it is something to be excited about. It is something to be excited about. Or the next day, the very next day, I think, two more opportunities in a different environment, able to share my faith with someone who hasn't yet made a decision for Jesus Christ because I made a biblical decision and they wanted to know why I made that decision and they asked me about Jesus. Or within two hours after that moment, going to another place to, to, and, and just doing my job with glory unto the Lord and, and all its imperfections. And this person has not been in church for years because of the hurt and pain they experienced somewhere. Start asking me about church and my relationship with Jesus. And they are recultivated to get back in fellowship. Family, this is what God is doing in this city and where you live. And we get to be a part of that. And, you know, it's nothing is mundane. Look, we know this. Luke, uh, excuse me, Mark 9, 38 through 50. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there is one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterward to speak of me. That's cool. Speak, uh, speak evil of me, sorry. Verse 40, follow me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. It's a cup of water. You're handing someone just a cup of water. And this could have very significant spiritual consequence tied to it. And so don't tell me, I, I'm sorry, I was in love. Let me back, back off, boy. Uh... <laughs> Don't tell me when I'm, be, I'm being hyper-spiritual because I think that God is connected to what I'm doing by handing you this cup when the word just said it's true. Like I'm getting a reward in heaven. Join in. Right? Praise the Lord. And that's not condescending. 
this is like, Jesus is like saying, let's do this, man. Yeah, is there warfare? Is there battle? Is there moments of tears? Like we're talking about the mountaintop moments and some of the victories right now, but there's a reality that I might call you in two days crying saying I need prayer, right? And that's okay. It's okay, right? We're fam. We're spiritual bodies, a body of believers across this earth who've professed Jesus to be our Lord. We are his bride and we are going to see our groom. Yes, we are. And it's soon, so soon, family. It is soon, so soon. All right, so we need to wrap this up, okay? Life lesson. We are either gathering or scattering for Jesus, moment by moment, day by day. We are either gathering for Jesus or we're scattering for Jesus. These aren't my words. These are his, these are his words in verse 23. All right? So let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Last two verses, okay? Man, we could... When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes to a dry place seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Hey, I just have to be honest about something here. You know, it's important that we as believers don't use our personal, uh, excuse me, we don't use our freedom in Christ for personal gain. Right? It's important that we don't use, so here, a person is set free, a burden of some sort of guilt or shame or entanglement at the least. You, they were under demonic oppression at the minimum, maybe possession at the maximum. They're set free from that, right? It's important that you realize that that moment creates an opportunity for you to surrender to Jesus, it's not for you to go dancing around Kernersville saying, man, this is awesome, necessarily, for your own personal benefit. Trust me, you will benefit when Jesus forgives you of your sin. But uh, I, I have seen, and it's just, I've, it's happened in my own life. God has delivered me from something that I was entangled with, right? And I didn't replace that which he took away with more of him and what he was wanting to do in my life. I just felt good for a minute and ended up circling back and being more entangled than I ever was in the first place. It happened when I gave my life to Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus and I was reading the word and somehow I ended up with just one little small compromise and the next thing you know, I'm in the bar and in the club shouting with everybody else. I don't know if that's good, shouting in the club with everybody else for not Jesus. I don't know. I love you. You know, and so, so you're tracking with me, and that's a good thing. I'm going to ask the, uh, the worship team to come out, please. Listen. Um, main and plain, main and plain. Uh, Jesus sets us free to have an abundant life with Him. He doesn't set us free to have a synthetic, abundant life from, away from him. We didn't come to church today. Maybe initially we have. We, it wasn't to feel good. It was to come in contact with our king. It was to ask, hey, God, I have these things that are just, I need you. I want you. You know, I, we're, we're going to have the opportunity to be baptized. When we do an altar call in just a minute, if you want to spend time with Jesus in just a second, you'll be invited. And we'll also have a baptism. And I think that if you give your life to Jesus maybe here in just a few minutes, you say, okay, I want to follow Jesus, okay? I think baptism is a great first act. 
as time allows and as the appropriate appointment presents itself. But I think that baptism is a great thing to say, you know what, Jesus, not only have you healed me, not only have you forgiven me and you filled me up with your Holy Spirit, but you've created me to serve you. So I'm going to go serve you. I'm already saved. I received it. I've received your forgiveness, Jesus. I receive your Holy Spirit indwelling my life. I've confessed with my mouth that you're Lord. I receive your endless riches. And I'm going to be a gatherer. And I'm going to go get in the water because you did and you've called me to. I'm going to publicly identify so that other people can see and say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. I got a Jesus shirt on and I'm doing it too. Um, I, th- I, thought about, I thought about Cookie Monster for a minute. You know, I thought about sometimes, you know, we, after we have a moment with God, if we, if we don't spend time with Him, if we don't allow Him to cultivate that relationship and get to know Him better and walk in His plans for our life, it's like Cookie Monster going back to the world and eating a bunch of cookies, and he just keeps eating. He's like, rah, rah, more cookies, more cookies. He's not satisfied. I've seen a lot of people be in pain and trial from having a moment with God that was real and genuine and expect to find the fulfillment once again in the world that leaves them empty, hurting, and in desperate pain. Like I've seen this like hundreds of times probably. I've also seen probably way more than that many victories of someone saying, all right, Jesus, I don't know where you're at in the spectrum today, but I have a question. Will you let Jesus have your life? Will you let him use everything in your life to gather others for his glory? Will you let Jesus have your life? It's not about you being awesome. It's not about you doing something right now. It's just saying, will you let him have it? And I have another question. Will you let him use everything in your life to gather others for his glory? It's a decision. And, man, it's a blessed decision if you choose wisely. Like he's putting before you today blessing and cursing. There's nothing better. Or do you want to scatter? Do you want to scatter others away from Jesus. So today, she's going to sing in just a moment. And I encourage you, if you want to give your life to Jesus, this is a great symbolic gesture of coming and humbling yourself before Jesus physically, but it's it's a good practical example of what you're doing spiritually. I'm saying, Jesus, I'm giving you my life afresh right now. And then also, it's a great way to come up here and say, Jesus, I want you to use everything in my life to gather for your glory. And if you'd like to get baptized today, you can get baptized. You can say, Jesus, I've made that decision. I want you to use my life for your glory. And it starts right here, right now. So I don't know where you're at. I pray that we would choose wisely. We would reaffirm what Christ wants to do in our life if you already have a relationship with him, but if you've never asked him for a relationship today, if you would say, I give you my life, I receive your forgiveness. When I walk through deep waters, I know that you will be with me. When I'm standing I will not be overcome Through the valley of the shadow I will not fear I am not alone I am not alone You will go before me
like to receive Jesus' forgiveness today for everything you've ever done and everything you will do, you can receive it right now. It's just talking to him and receiving it. It's not about works, lest any one of us should boast. It's a free gift that he already purchased. If that's you, I encourage you to right now just talk to him you could talk to him like this dear Jesus I believe you died for me so I could be forgiven I believe you took my punishment for dishonoring you please forgive me of all my sin Fill me with your spirit. And help me to live for you. Every day. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Lord, there's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than having a relationship with you. Thank you that we get to have a relationship with you. Lord, continue to have your way. Use us to be gatherers for your kingdom, for your glory. I thank you for what you're doing in this place, God. This assembly of saints, this fellowship of believers, this group of followers of you. Thank you for what you're doing here. It's exciting. In Jesus' name.